They call it the Death Watch, the period leading up to condemned prisoners' execution. It's a time of isolation and waiting as the prisoner counts down the final hours of their life. What goes through their mind in those final moments? Do they reflect on their actions or do they hold out hope for a last-minute miracle? In this video, we'll be looking at the final hours of death row prisoners on their last day on Earth. Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy is a famous serial killer and rapist who is regarded as one of the most notorious criminals of the 20th century. Between 1974 and 1978, Bundy went on a rampage, sexually assaulting and killing several women in different areas, including Washington, Oregon, Colorado, Utah, and Florida. In 1979 and 1980, Bundy went through two trials where he represented himself. He had attended law school for a few years, so he knew his way around a trial. He was always calm, confident, and nonchalant during cross-examination. Notwithstanding, the evidence that was brought up against him was beyond deniable. So by the end of 1979, he received two death sentences. But that wasn't the end for Ted Bundy. In 1980, he went through another trial for the murder of 12-year-old Kimberly Leach, who was his last victim in Florida. There, he was sentenced to death by electrocution for the third time. Bundy spent nearly a decade on death row in the Florida State Prison, also known as Stark Prison. As is usual with death row inmates, he tried appealing his sentence severally, but while still appealing, he started to grant interviews. In these interviews, Bundy would talk about the crimes and his thought processes, although he made sure to speak in third person. He talked about his career as a thief and confessed that most of his valuable properties were stolen. He reveled in the fact that if he wanted something, he would go out and take it without paying. This mentality most likely played a role in his decision to rape and murder his victims. He would go out and brutally take any woman he wanted, even if it meant doing so without their consent. When his execution date was set for July 2nd, 1986, Bundy decided it was time to finally open up about the entirety of his crimes. He confessed to two detectives that he had killed 30 women, although some people believe he is responsible for the murders of over 100 women. He told them how he would revisit the sites where he murdered the victims and perform sexual acts with their decaying bodies, and he would do that for days until he no longer could. As horrifying as it sounds, necrophilia wasn't the only unbelievable thing Bundy did. He also confessed that he used to chop off some of his victims' heads with a hacksaw and take the heads home as some kind of trophy. After a couple of delays, Bundy's execution date was set for January 24, 1989. For his last meal, he did not make any special requests and was given the regular prison food, which was steak, eggs, hash browns, and toast. However, he lost his appetite and wasn't able to touch the food. On his last night alive, hundreds of people set up camp outside the prison, cheering and anticipating his death. Inside the prison, Bundy was coming to terms with his fate, and so he made two last phone calls to his mother to say his last goodbyes. The notorious killer last words were, I'd like to give my love to my family and friends. He was executed by electrocution at 7.16 a.m. with 42 people present to witness his death. As soon as he was confirmed dead, the people who had been waiting for the news in front of the prison set off fireworks and danced in happiness. After Ted Bundy was executed, his body was taken to the medical examiner's office for an autopsy. His brain was removed and handed over to scientists who examined it for any abnormalities that could have resulted in his horrific acts. At last, Bundy's body was cremated based on his request, and his ashes were scattered in Washington's Cascade Mountains, the same place where he disposed of the bodies of some of his victims. John Wayne Gacy John Gacy's childhood was troubled as his relationship with his father was strained. His father, who was an alcoholic, would often physically and emotionally abuse him, his sisters, and their mother. Growing up, Gacy may have encountered troubles understanding his sexuality as he was attracted to men but lived in a society that was largely homophobic. Faced with this challenge, Gacy went ahead and got married. He then moved to Waterloo, Iowa, where his wife's family owned three restaurants and became a manager. Gacy's life seemed perfect until May 1968, when he was charged with sexually assaulting two young boys. That was the beginning of Gacy's trip down an evil path, one that would ultimately lead to his untimely end. In November that year, he pleaded guilty to one count of sodomy and was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment. Around the same time, his wife divorced him and left with his children. While in prison, Gacy became a model prisoner, and after serving 18 months of his sentence, he was released on parole in June 1970. As soon as he got out of prison, Gacy moved back to Chicago, where he was born, to start his life afresh. Gacy did a good job of starting afresh. He started a successful company, got married, became a churchgoer, and was known for throwing elaborate block parties. However, an evil side of him existed, and was lurking in the dark, waiting to be unleashed. The sudden disappearance of a young boy 
boy named Robert Piest in December 1978 led to an investigation that would eventually lead to the arrest of John Gacy. It turned out that Gacy had been luring young boys into his home, after which he would molest them sexually and then kill them. Gacy was finally arrested on December 22, 1978, after which he confessed to the murders of about 30 or more young boys. After hearing the confession, the police searched his home and found 26 bodies hidden in a crawl space. Gacy's trial started in February 1980, and he was charged with 33 murders. He was found guilty of the murder charges, as well as sexual assault, and was sentenced to death. Gacy spent 14 years on death row at the Menard Correctional Center. The isolation that comes with being on death row led him to start painting. He would paint different clowns, skulls, his home, and birds. His paintings even got put on display and were sold at auctions. As interesting as that might sound, it wasn't the only thing Gacy took an interest in. He read a wide range of law books and amassed the knowledge he needed to apply for numerous appeals. However, his knowledge and appeals did nothing to save him, as in October 1994, the execution date was set for May 10, 1994. The day before his execution, Gacy was moved to Stateville Correctional Center, where the execution would take place. Gacy spent the afternoon with his family in a picnic held on prison grounds. For his last meal, Gacy requested a bucket of KFC chicken, a dozen fried shrimp, french fries, fresh strawberries, and a Diet Coke. In the evening, he was visited by a Catholic priest who performed the last rites just before he was escorted to the execution chamber. As Gacy was preparing his mind to die, a crowd was gathering outside the Stateville Correctional Center, waiting for his execution. Most of them were happy that Gacy's reign of evil was coming to an end. After being strapped to the execution chair, Gacy's supposed last words were, Kiss my ass but a lawyer who was present argued that he was speaking to a prison official. Gacy was ultimately executed by lethal injection. Gacy's body was eventually cremated. Aileen Warnos. Aileen Warnos was born to an underage mother who abandoned her with her grandparents. By the time she was 11 years old, Aileen was already selling her body in school in exchange for drugs, food, and cigarettes. She got involved in sexual transactions from an early age, so she decided to make a career out of it by becoming a prostitute. Before becoming a serial killer, Aileen had a long criminal record and was arrested severally for different reasons, including robberies. Between the ages of 14 and 22, Aileen had seen the worst the world had to offer and had tried to take her own life a total of six times, but she always failed. While working as a prostitute, Aileen developed a hunger for blood and unleashed it on men. Between 1989 and 1990, she murdered seven men between the ages of 40 and 65 and became known as the Damsel of Death. Aileen was eventually arrested in Florida and charged with the murder of six men. During her trial, Warnos claimed that the murders were committed in self-defense as she was being sexually assaulted by the men. Although she was said to have suffered from borderline personality disorder, disorder and antisocial personality disorder, Aileen was not exonerated. The prosecution argued that she had committed the murders for financial gain. By February 1993, Aileen had been sentenced to death six times for all the murders except one. From the time of her incarceration till the time of execution, Aileen spent 12 years on death row. Warnos's stay on death row was filled with ups and downs as she started to make some weird claims. In 2002, she started accusing the prison matrons of adding saliva, urine, and dirt to her food. She claimed that prisoners officials were working hard to frustrate her into committing suicide before the execution. In the long run, Aileen complained about a long list of things, including low water pressure, mildew on her mattress, tight handcuffs, and many more. These constant complaints about her living conditions may have been a ploy to get her out of death row or an attempt to eat herself a pardon, but whatever the case, this tactic never worked. In the weeks before her execution, Aileen granted interviews where she stated that her mind was tortured. She also talked about how she felt about the way she was being portrayed in the media. Aileen felt that she had been unfairly portrayed as a monster and was also being depicted as a cold-blooded killer with no regard for human life. Aileen was executed by lethal injection on October 9, 2002. For her last meal, she did not request for anything other than a cup of coffee. The last words she uttered were, Yes, I would just like to say I'm sailing with the rock and I'll be back, like Independence Day, with Jesus. June 6, like the movie, Big Mother Ship and all, I'll be back, I'll be back. Aileen was the second woman to be executed in Florida since the reinstatement of the death penalty in 1976. After Aileen Warnos's execution, her body was cremated, and her ashes were given to her childhood friend, Dawn Botkins, who had remained close to her despite her crimes. Botkins took the ashes to Michigan and scattered them beneath a tree. When she was alive, Aileen loved listening to Natalie Merchant's album, Tiger Lily, and requested that a song from the album be played at her funeral. Her request was eventually granted. Barbara Graham. By the time she was 22, 
Barbara Graham was already working as a prostitute at a brothel where she got into gambling and the use of illegal drugs. She made friends with known criminals and hardened ex-convicts who introduced her to all sorts of criminal activities. After three failed marriages in the past, Barbara got married to Henry Graham in 1953. He worked as a bartender but was a low-life criminal who was addicted to drugs. Barbara soon became friends with her husband's friends, who were also criminals. In no time, she began to hang out with the likes of Jack Santo and Emmett Perkins. Barbara's friendship with Jack Santo and Emmett Perkins would later lead to her worst crimes and eventual death. As their friendship blossomed, Barbara started an affair with Perkins. He told her about his plans to rob an elderly woman who allegedly kept large sums of money and expensive jewelry in her house. When their plan was set, Barbara, Santo, Perkins, and two other accomplices went to the woman's home, turned her house upside down, beat her up, and left her for dead. Despite their best efforts, the robbery was unsuccessful as they didn't find any money, but they had committed a grave offense, one that led the police right to them. During her trial, Barbara maintained her innocence, but the evidence presented against her, including witness testimony and physical evidence led to her conviction. In the court of public opinion, she was nicknamed Bloody Babs due to the gravity of the murder and her lack of remorse. In 1955, Barbara, Santo, and Perkins were eventually found guilty of first-degree murder and were sentenced to death. Barbara made efforts to appeal her case, but they all failed, and her execution date was set for June 3, 1955. The day before her scheduled execution, Barbara was transferred to San Quentin State Prison, where the execution took place. For most of the time, she felt uneasy pacing back and forth in the execution chamber holding cell. It was a small cell, and she could only take four steps between the wall and the door. She later received a visit from the prison's warden, who sat with her while they conversed in a calm manner. It was as though he knew she was terrified and was determined to help her calm down. Before leaving her cell, the warden ordered the prison officials to serve Barbara as many double chocolate milkshakes as she wanted. For all we know, Barbara consumed nothing but milkshakes the night before her execution. On the morning of July 3rd, Barbara had breakfast, which was a hot fudge sundae. She was terrified of being executed and was known to openly express her disbelief concerning the situation. Her execution by gas chamber was scheduled for 10 a.m. but was delayed until 11.30 a.m. when Barbara herself started to protest the delays. Barbara was led to the gas chamber where she requested to be blindfolded because she didn't want to see the observers' faces. Her last words were, good people are always so sure they're right, but when she was advised to take a deep breath to make the death process easier, she retorted saying, how the hell would you know? The execution was witnessed by 30 people, including reporters and prison guards. Her husband Henry claimed her body, which was later buried in Mount Olivet Cemetery, San Rafael, California. Carlton Gary. Carlton Gary is an American serial killer who allegedly raped nine elderly women and killed seven of them between 1977 and 1978. For most of his life, Gary was in prison for one reason or another, but he was the least suspected person for the murders of these women. At the time of his arrest in December 1978, Gary was involved in a robbery in South Carolina. He confessed to the robbery and was given a 21-year sentence. In March 1983, barely five years into his sentence, Gary escaped from custody and remained at large for a year before he was arrested again. Investigations into the murders of those elderly women by a serial killer who had been tagged the stocking strangler took a different turn when new evidence led the authorities straight to Gary. They had found a gun and a fingerprint match that proved he was the serial killer who had been terrorizing the city of Columbus, Georgia. Finding his fingerprint at one crime scene may have been a coincidence, but this wasn't the case because Gary's fingerprints were found at four different crime scenes. Gary was indicted for the murders in May 1980. And while he did admit that he was indeed in the houses of those women, he insisted that he didn't commit the murders and that another person had killed the victims. Despite Gary's attempts to maintain his innocence, the prosecution's case against him was strong, and with all the evidence against him, he was convicted and sentenced to death for three of the seven murders in August 1986. As a death row inmate, Gary was held in a six by nine foot cell where he spent most of his time in solitude. As is customary for death row inmates, he was allowed one hour of exercise per day. His cell had a television and a radio to keep him company. As the years passed, Gary developed a keen interest in art and started to showcase his artistic talent. He spent his time hand-making Christmas and birthday cards for people. Aside from art, Gary's life took a positive turn when he got married in 1996. He met his bride through a church group that would often visit the prisoners. Not only did he get married, he also adopted the woman's daughter. Despite being behind bars, Gary loved his wife and formed a close bond with his adopted daughter. For the longest time, Gary hoped that one day he would be exonerated, but that day never came. He appealed severally for years, but his verdict remained the same. On December 16, 2009, about four hours to his execution, Gary's hopes of an exoneration were rekindled when the Georgia Supreme Court put a hold on his execution. 
This was done because the court wanted to determine whether it was necessary to conduct DNA tests to prove him innocent or guilty of the crimes. Unfortunately for Gary, all hopes were crushed permanently in February 2018, when a new date of execution was set for March 15, 2018. During his final preparations before his execution, Gary refused to eat his final meal. He also rejected the offer of making a prayer. For someone who was known as a charismatic and chatty person, Gary surprisingly did not make any final statements before his execution. At the age of 66, Gary was executed by lethal injection at the Georgia Diagnostic and Classification Prison in Jackson, Georgia. The state of Georgia uses the prison as an execution center, as well as a museum that exhibits artifacts related to the history of capital punishment in the state. What happened to Gary's body remains unknown, but it is possible that he was buried in an unmarked grave or that his body was cremated. Gary Gilmore Gary Gilmore turned to crime at a young age and was first arrested at age 14. In 1964, he was sentenced to 15 years in prison for assault and armed robbery. He was later released on parole in April 1976, after which he moved in with his cousin in Provo, Utah. There, he tried to take on legitimate jobs twice but failed each time. Frustrated, Gilmore went right back to his violent tendencies stealing and drinking. In July 1976, just a few months after he was paroled, Gilmore upgraded his status from an ordinary criminal to a murderer. On the 19th of July, Gary Gilmore walked into a gas station in Orem, Utah. He robbed the station, but before he left, he fatally shot Max Jensen, an employee at the station. As if killing one man wasn't enough, the following day, Gilmore robbed a motel in Provo, but he didn't leave without shooting the motel's manager, Ben Bushnell. Bushnell's wife had witnessed the encounter and watched Gilmore exit the premises with their cash box. Gilmore or accidentally shot himself in the right hand while he was trying to hide the murder weapon in a patch of bushes. When he returned to a service garage where he left his truck to be repaired before going to rob the motel, the garage owner noticed his hand bleeding. As he drove off, the garage owner called the police and gave them his license plate number. Gilmore was apprehended through the help of his cousin Brenda, who alerted the police once he called her to help him with bandages and painkillers for his injury. Gilmore's trial began in October 1976 and lasted only two days. He was found guilty of first degree murder and sentenced to death. Gilmore's response to the death sentence was very unlikely and caught the attention of the media. He accepted his sentence and didn't make an effort to appeal the capital punishment given to him. This response was shocking and left many people wondering why he would choose to accept such a severe punishment. Was he truly remorseful or did he feel that death was the only way to end his suffering? During his time on death row, Gary Gilmore lived a life of isolation and monotony, as is usual with death row inmates. However, something about Gilmore stood out. It seemed like he was rather Rather eager to die. Gilmore's execution was delayed a few times, and he reacted by going on a hunger strike to protest the delays. He proved his willingness to die when he wrote a letter to his mother, requesting that she stop trying to appeal on his behalf. Between November and December that year, Gilmore attempted suicide twice, but was stopped just in time. In Utah, there were only two methods of execution, hanging and firing squad. Gilmore opted for the firing squad because he thought hanging could go wrong. The evening before his execution on January 17, 1977, Gilmore requested a simple last meal of steak, potatoes, milk, and coffee, but only took the milk and coffee. On the morning of the execution, he was taken to the execution chamber, where he was strapped to a chair. Behind him were sandbags that would trap the bullets. His acceptance of the death penalty was not the only thing that made Gilmore stand out. His choice of last words also made him famous. When he was asked if he had any last words, Gilmore simply said, let's do it. After his execution, Gilmore's body was not immediately laid to rest. Although he was a criminal for most of his life, he did one last good deed before dying. He requested that some of his organs be donated to those who were in need. After he was confirmed dead, Gilmore's corneas were removed and sent to the University of Utah Medical Center, and within 24 hours, two people had received them. After an autopsy that day, his body was cremated and his ashes were scattered from an airplane. David Mason David Mason went from petty crimes like stealing and prostitution to terrorizing the city of Oakland, California between March and December 1980, killing at least four elderly people in their homes. In January 1981, Mason was involved in a car chase with the police and was able to escape, but he left the car behind. The authorities then used the information obtained from the car to locate his house. At the house, they were able to speak to Mason's mom and brother. The pair gave them a video cassette made by Mason himself. In the video, Mason confessed to all his crimes, describing them in detail. He had left the video with his family in case something happened to him. Based on Mason's confessions, a warrant was issued for his arrest. And on February 4th, 1981, when the police arrived at the Holiday Inn where he was staying, he offered no resistance and was taken into custody without incident. Mason confessed all his crimes, but he added another murder to the list law enforcement already had. He confessed 
to killing his lover, Robert Groff, because during an argument, Groff admitted he intentionally infected Mason with herpes. Before his trial, Mason was held at the Alameda County Jail, where he and a fellow inmate teamed up to murder another inmate. At the beginning of his trial in 1983, Mason pleaded not guilty to all charges against him. However, he was found guilty of the five murders. In January 1984, Mason was sentenced to death. He was transferred to the San Quentin State Prison, where he remained until the execution. Mason eventually fell in love with a woman named Charlene and got married to her while on death row. As time passed, the convicted criminal and husband opened up about his guilt, admitted all his crimes, and showed great remorse for the evil he had done. Mason did show remorse, but no one knew the extent of it until June 1993, when he voluntarily withdrew an appeal his lawyer had drawn. If he had let the appeal go through, it could have gotten him a new trial that would have overturned his death sentence, but Mason didn't want to take that opportunity. He stated that he decided to withdraw the appeal because he wanted to use himself as an example to other criminals so they wouldn't follow his footsteps. His execution date was then set for August 24, 1993 by his request. Few weeks before his execution, Mason granted some journalists an interview where he described his time on death row. He also spoke about how he understood the pain he caused to his victims' families and how he was ready to take responsibility for his actions. Although Mason received over 200 letters from people begging him to reconsider the appeal, his mind was made up. As the execution date drew nearer, Mason chose to spend his last day on Earth with his family. When asked about his last meal, he refused to make a request. Instead, he asked that he and his family be served the same food given to prisoners. In his last hours, Mason requested to have unlimited access to the telephone. He chose not to speak to a priest, and his last request was for a glass of ice water. Mason was executed by gas chamber on August 24, 1993. On entering the chamber, the officials let him know that he had the power to delay the execution by just saying he wanted to appeal his sentence. This advice fell on deaf ears because Mason had decided his own fate and chose to die. When asked if he had any last words, Mason told the warden that he had none. David Mason was the last inmate to be executed in this manner in California. Not much information is known about the final disposition of Mason's remains. However, like other death row inmates, his body may have been cremated or it may have been buried in an unmarked grave. Wesley Allen Dodd. Wesley Dodd's trail of sexual offenses began when he was just 13 years old and lasted for a decade until he became a murderer. As a teenager, he would offer to babysit his neighbor's children with the ulterior motive of abusing them when their parents were not around. Over the course of 15 years, Dodd managed to sexually abuse over 50 children. He eventually met his Waterloo in November 1989 when he was arrested for trying to kidnap a little boy from a movie theater in Washington. Further investigation into the case led the police to find the depth of Dodd's wicked desires and how far he had gone to fulfill them. It turned out that Dodd was responsible for the murder of three little boys in Vancouver that same year. Over the course of a three-day investigation, Dodd finally confessed to killing the three boys. Using his confession, the police obtained a warrant to search his house, and the search yielded the most bizarre things. Investigators found newspaper clippings of his crimes in a scrapbook, a briefcase containing his victim's underwear, and a photo album filled with pictures of different children he had molested. The worst thing that was found in his house was his diary, where he explicitly detailed all the murders how he committed them, and how he planned to do more. With this new evidence, Dodd was charged with aggravated first-degree murder and attempted kidnapping. He pleaded guilty to all charges and was sentenced to death in 1990. After sentencing, Dodd was given the opportunity to choose between lethal injection and hanging. And he chose hanging because that was exactly how he killed his last victim. After getting the death sentence, Dodd made no effort whatsoever to appeal his case or the sentence. Rather, he claimed that it would be better for the world if he were executed because he could not be rehabilitated. To make it worse, Dodd stated that if he got the chance, he would continue to assault and kill children and that he would enjoy every bit of it. His statements were a chilling revelation of the man he was, a man who was beyond redemption. And while some questioned his motives for such shocking admissions, it was clear that he wanted to be executed. For Dodd, death seemed to be the only way to end the guilt and pain he felt. While awaiting execution, Dodd used his time to spread the word on pedophilia. He granted interviews to reporters, made appearances on TV shows, and spoke generally to anyone who cared to listen to him. While still advocating for his execution, Dodd wrote a self-defense booklet for children where he gave tips on how to stay safe from pedophilic men like him. Wesley Dodd was eventually executed by hanging on January 5, 1993. For his last meal, he requested broiled salmon and fried potatoes. His execution took place in an indoor gallows at Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla. The execution was witnessed by local and regional personnel, members of the victim's family, 
families and prison officials. Dodd's last words were, I was once asked by somebody, I don't remember who, if there was any way sex offenders could be stopped. I said, no, I was wrong. I was wrong when I said there was no hope, no peace. There is hope, there is peace. I found both in the Lord, Jesus Christ. Look to the Lord and you will find peace. Dodd was the first person to be executed by hanging in the United States in over 30 years. Once the rope was placed around his neck, a deafening silence enveloped the place. As soon as the hangman pulled the lever, it was only a matter of seconds before Dodd's life was over. Immediately after he was confirmed dead, Dodd's body was moved to Seattle, where an autopsy was carried out. After the autopsy, the body was cremated, and his ashes were handed over to his family. Over the years, death row inmates have behaved differently in their last few hours. Some continue to fight until the end, others accept their fate in peace, while others, like Wesley Dodd, ask for a speedy execution. However, there is no way of telling how anyone would choose to spend their last hours on Earth. Check out this next video to learn about the experiences of death row inmates behind bars.